Good evening and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Corinne and I will be your moderator. We are excited to welcome Philip Curtis, Director of Sales at Unitas Dental as our speaker today. He will be discussing three key strategies that he utilized to help thousands of dental practices maximize their new dental practice opportunities. Before we get started, we have a few reminders for you. At any point during the webinar, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel and we will answer them live at the end. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Unitas Dental. Philip, welcome and thanks for being with us. All right, well, thanks for everybody for joining today. Uh, kind of like Corinne said, my name is Philip Curtis. I'm from Unitas Dental. Super excited to talk to you today about uh, things that you can do or tips that you can understand prior to starting a new dental practice. Um, there's gonna be a lot of information that we're gonna cover today. Um, and so if you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to send them in through the Q&A window or the chat window. And Corinne and I will kind of knock those out towards the end of the presentation. So as you think of them, feel free to send them in and then we will uh, answer those as we get towards the end. Um, also, um, here's my contact information. So after the webinar, if you needed to read, reach out to me because I wasn't able to answer your question or you'd like to speak on the phone, here's my phone number and my email. It's just philip at unitasdental.com. So again, my name is Philip Curtis. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing at Unitas Dental. You may have heard about us before, maybe this is your first webinar attending with us, but we've been helping dental practices since 2011 with a lot of different services. We've worked with thousands of practices, we've been in all 50 states, and we represent over a thousand locations right now. We're located in Arizona, we've got over 55 insurance experts on staff, and the core of what we do is help negotiate insurance reimbursements. We also help uh, credential doctors with insurance. We help different types of dental practices, whether you're an established practice looking to increase your reimbursement rates or you're starting a brand new practice, whether you're buying or you're building. Uh, we help lots of different dental practices. Today, primarily what I'm going to go over though are the things and the steps that we've learned in helping start so many new dental practices. And they're really common. Uh, it's common misinformation or common mistakes that practices make that I wanted to share with you. Um, because these three things, if you can understand them and prevent these mistakes from happening prior to opening your new dental practice, you can really set yourself up for success for years to come. We feel really strongly about these things, and they're so common that I really wanted to go over these today. Some of these may seem rudimentary, but um, I do want to go through kind of the, the nitty gritty details of how to avoid these problems and strategies that you can implement. So like I said, go through this. If you have questions, feel free to write them out and then take notes if you can. And we'd be happy to chat with you afterwards if you still have more questions. But let's talk about the three things that we're going to go over today. So number one, I'm going to mainly talk about how you can competitively price your UCR office fees for your area. We're also going to talk about how to ensure your credential with the right insurances or the right PPOs for your area. And then lastly, we're going to talk about how to maximize your profits and to receive higher PPO reimbursements. So first and foremost, let's kind of go over how you can competitively price those UCRs for your area. Before I go into that, I kind of want to ask the question, why does this matter or why should you care? Um, some practices may see the value of this, some of you may not, but why this should matter to you and why UCRs are so important is because your starting UCR rates or the prices that you pr price your procedures at are largely going to determine the success of your practice, especially if it's your first couple of years of doing business. So your UCR rates from what we've experienced can affect quite a few different areas of your business. Number one, they're going to affect the types of patients that you attract. So whether you're super high or super low, it's going to affect potentially the reimbursement rates that you receive from the insurance companies. It's also going to affect obviously your, your ability to scale, to hire, to grow and market your practice. And overall, it's going to affect the profitability of your practice in general. So it's a super important thing to take advantage of and to make sure that you're doing so effectively and make sure they're not making common mistakes. So what's really the process for setting those competitive UCRs? There's a couple of different steps that we help our practices evaluate. And these are the specific things that you can do on your own uh, to make sure that your UCRs are both competitive in your area and setting you up for success in the future. So first and foremost, I always recommend that you utilize any available percentile based analysis tool that's gonna help you evaluate and figure out what are the common UCRs for your area. Most of them break them down to percentiles. I know Henry Schein offers an analysis like this. We offer an analysis like this. There's other companies out there. They typically will suggest different percentiles. In our experience, we found that the 60, 70, or 80th percentile of a given uh, UCR data set is going to tell you what a competitive rate will be for your zip code. So number one, you're going to want to ensure that you review those UCR fees annually. 
after you've set them and you're accounting for increasing costs. But by and large, the most important thing is to start high. We always recommend starting competitive and starting in a good range because there's a lot of things that that will help increase and pull up. Number one, it's going to help your fee schedule reimbursements that come from insurance companies. So once you receive those fee schedules and you get credentialed, which we're going to talk about later on, how you can do that, ways you can do it more most effectively. Once you have what those reimbursement rates are, you really want to make sure that you're comparing them against your UCRs. So once you've used an analysis tool and you've chosen which UCR office fees you want to set your practice at, after you've done that, go back and analyze them against the reimbursement rates that you've agreed to. So what you'll want to do is start by entering in all of the PPO fee schedules that you have. Now, every fee schedule has like 900 procedure codes on it. So in a lot of those, you're not going to ever do. So what I usually recommend is just really comparing your top 20 to 35 procedures that you feel are going to be the most popular for you. So like your pro fees, your, your crowns, uh, maybe your dentures, uh, whatever type of uh, procedures that you think are going to be most popular. Plug those into a spreadsheet and then plug in the UCR office fees that you've set. And then start to plug in the reimbursement rates that you're getting for every insurance company. Then what you're going to want to do is compare them, make sure that your UCR is not below any of your PPO reimbursements. You want to make sure that it's substantially above your highest paying PPO reimbursement. A typical rule of thumb is anywhere from about 20 to 30% above your highest paying PPO fee schedule. If any of your UCRs are below any of your PPO reimbursements, you absolutely should increase them. No UCR should be below your reimbursing fee schedules. The reason why is because the whole purpose of a PPO is that they provide a discount to the patient. So if you're saying, hey, my procedure is priced at $80 and a PPO is willing to reimburse you at $90, well, then you need to come up, right? Because what that means is you're never going to get $90 because they're never going to pay you above your UCR office fee. They want to show to the patient that they took a discount off of what your UCR is. So you want to make sure that none of those are below. And if they are, you want to increase those above. Typically, rule of thumb is about 20 to 30% above your highest paying fee schedule. Okay. Like I said, high UCRs generally correlate to high reimbursement rates. When you're submitting claims to insurance companies, those are, the, those are the data points that they pay attention to when they're setting fee schedules for your area and when they're offering you fee schedules. Or in the future, later on down the road, when you negotiate with them again, those are going to be the things that they're going to take into account, meaning what you've been billing, what your UCRs have been, in comparison to whether or not they want to negotiate with you. So setting competitive and high UCR office fees is super important. It allows you to make the most amount of profit you can for patients that you treat that are out of network, but then also in network because it correlates to having higher reimbursements. So that's why it's so important. Now, number two, let's talk about how do you ensure that you're credentialed with the right insurances for your area? And again, I kind of want to ask, well, why does this matter? So some, some dentists might think, you know what, I'm just going to credential with all the insurance companies. I just want to kind of shoot the shotgun out there, put a wide net, whatever you want to think of, and make sure that I'm in network with all the insurances, which isn't a bad strategy. But the thing is that most dentists worry about are a little bit different than that. So many dentists that we talk to worry about the number of insurances that they should accept or the specific insurances that they should accept. So they ask themselves, or they ask us, Am I taking too many insurances or am I planning to take too few insurances? Are these rates that I'm agreeing to, are they competitive? Uh, how do I know if I'm missing out on potential patients if I don't join some additional insurances? Those types of questions pop up a lot, especially when you're opening a new dental practice. Even when you're acquiring an existing practice, or even if you have an established practice, you're going to ask those questions. So there's a couple of steps you can follow to resolve those issues. Like, am I taking too many? Do I know if I'm taking the right ones? How do I know that these rates are competitive? How do I know I'm not missing out on potential patients? There's some steps you can follow to address that. And so really what you want to do is kind of evaluate and perform three specific steps. Number one, we're going to talk about how to perform what we call a local market analysis. Then we'll talk about how you verify those results against your peers. And then lastly, how you're going to evaluate those fee schedule offers based on reimbursement and see if they're competitive. Okay. So let's jump into that local market analysis. A lot of practices attempt to do this, but this is a really a fail-proof, simple strategy to implement. It takes a little bit of time. Uh, it takes quite a bit of time, but it's worth that research to figure out really what the main PPO pairs are in your area. So in our experience, the Chamber of Commerce in your specific zip code or city is a really good resource for giving you a list of top employers or businesses in your area. A lot of Chambers of Commerce will give you that list if you ask for it, or they will read it off to you. Maybe they'll, they'll send it to you in a PDF, or maybe they have it on their website. So there's a lot of Chamber of Commerce that have that information readily accessible. 
Um, if you don't have access to your chamber of commerce or they don't have that information, there are third party um, softwares or lists that you can purchase uh, that give you good information. I know there's a big company out there that basically all they do is give out the employer information specifically to other companies who are trying to market to them, right? So they have that data and for nominal fees, I don't think it's that much. You can go and purchase those big employer lists to see who the employers are, what their contact information is, how many employees they have. And then what you can do once you have that contact info is you can contact each of those local businesses. Generally, you want to just ask for their HR department where you can ask whoever's on the phone and you can just say something like, hey, I'm a new dentist in your area. I'm just curious who your guys' insurance benefits are through because I want to be able to treat your patients. So are you taking, you know, are you getting Aetna? Are you getting Cigna? What insurance benefits are they giving to you? 90% of the time, whoever's on the phone, obviously is an employee, whether they're HR or not, should be able to tell you. They're like, oh yeah, I think we have United Healthcare. Or yeah, we've got Cigna. So what you want to do is you want to document all that information. So whether you get it from a third party or you're collecting it from Chamber of Commerce, you're going to make a report similar to this one I have here on the screen with the name of the company, the address, their phone number, and who they have their dental benefits through. You're going to be, document all that basic contact information because in the future, you're going to use that to market to them. But then also you're going to be able to use that list to ensure that you're content, considering to credential with those PPOs that are popular in your area. Now, if possible, you want to verify those results against dentist peers in your area or in your surrounding areas. They don't have to be super close to you, but in a city next door or a couple cities next door, you can call up a practice and let them know saying, hey, I'm a new practice I'm opening in such and such area. Here's some of the PBOs I'm planning on working with. Do you guys find that those are also popular ones? Like you would experience, most dental practices are pretty amicable with each other, and they will definitely help and share that information with you. So I recommend doing that. I don't think that there's any problem in asking. If they say, say no, you can always ask another practice. So verifying that result will just give you that much more of an assurance that these are popular PPOs. And then what you're going to want to do is you're going to begin to reach out to each of these insurance companies and request what's called a proposed fee schedule. So a lot of times you're going to contact provider relations or general phone number or an email for an insurance company and indicate that you want to credential with them. A lot of times they'll respond back to you immediately with an application. If that application doesn't come with a fee schedule, do not fill out the application. Do not fill out the application. If you don't know what rates you're agreeing to or what you're signing up for, probably don't want to sign up with that insurance company until you know. And so a lot of times they should be able to give you what's called a proposed fee schedule. And so you just want to keep digging in until they give that to you. Then you're going to collect all that information for a couple other steps down the road here. But those are the basic core steps of gathering a local market analysis to see, A, who are the big players in my area? And B, what are they willing to pay me so that way I can evaluate whether or not I want to join them? So those are the two big steps that you're going to want to figure through and, and document. And again, you can put it into a simple spreadsheet. It just takes some time. But again, when you're starting a practice, especially if you have some time before you're opening your doors, this is the type of research that you're going to want to invest in. Okay. Now, once you get those reimbursements back from an insurance company, there's a couple of things that you can do to evaluate really how competitive or the type or the grade of that fee schedule. Now, the way that you can do that is you can put it into a report similar to this. So here's a report that we do for our clients when we're evaluating whether or not it's a competitive insurance company to join. Um, it really comes down to a couple of different variables. Number one, what are your top procedure codes? What are the UCR office fees you've set for those? And then what are the reimbursement rates that they're agreeing to pay you on? Okay. It always comes down to focusing on procedure codes that you actually care about. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to create a report similar to this. It can just be a very simple spreadsheet where you plug in those main procedures, the UCRs that you're getting, that you've decided to price those procedures at, and then the PPO reimbursement. So again, if it's a D0120 and you're getting reimbursed $55, you're going to plug that in. And then 75, 100, 230, whatever the reimbursement rate is that you found on that proposed fee schedule. Then in an additional column, you can do some simple math in a formula that basically is just, I want to take the reimbursement rate divided by the UCR, and that's going to give you a percentage. So maybe for your pro fee, it's going to be 53% of your UCR. For your crown, maybe it's 75% of your UCR. So you're going to plug that in all into the spreadsheet and then just create a simple little average formula to give you what the average percentage of UCR is for that PPO. That's going to essentially give you a grade for that specific insurance company. Then you're going to do that specific analysis for every proposal you collect, specifically for the PPOs that you're considering joining based off of that local market analysis. Then what you'll do is you'll make some PPO participation decisions based off of what you're finding. So with that data, you're going to be able to compare some PPO fee schedules 
and determine what your average baseline percentage of reimbursement is going to look like. So if you started to plug them into a report like this, maybe you'll find that, okay, Emeritus is coming up at 69% or Assurance coming up at 78% or Delta is coming up at 68%. You can start to compare them against each other to number one, figure out what is kind of the average baseline and are any of these substantially higher or super below what that average baseline is. So you can consider whether or not that's, there's somebody that you want to join. Once you start to evaluate that, there's some additional decisions that you want to make. The first question you want to ask yourself is, as I'm evaluating these fee schedules, so if I'm looking at Aetna's fee schedule and Guardian's fee schedule and Sun Life's fee schedule, they're going to have different grades or different average UCR reimbursement percentages. You want to ask yourself, are there other participation options out there that could yield a higher percentage of reimbursement than what I've been presented with right now? And the answer is generally, yeah, there is. So if I go to Aetna and they come back with an offer, and let's say it's 65% of your UCR. Well, that's because that's what they're offering to you if you directly contract with them. So if you go send in an application, they're going to stick you on that fee schedule. Those are the rates that you're going to get. However, there's more than one way to participate with Aetna in network and to get reimbursed by them. And because there's more than one way, there's going to be different fee schedules. So if we go and evaluate what those are, whether that's going with Aetna through Guardian or Aetna through Sun Life or Aetna through Connection, some of them may have a fee schedule that's more, it's higher reimbursing on some procedures and overall is a better grade for you. So those are the types of things that you're going to want to evaluate and that I'm going to get into in kind of these next steps. But right now, I kind of want to pause. If you have any specific questions about what I've gone over so far, um, feel free to put them in through the Q&A window. We're going to get to those towards the end of the presentation. But for now, just want to make sure everybody's kind of understanding these steps. And then let's kind of jump into the next thing, which is how do you make sure that you're maximizing profits and receiving those high reimbursements? So again, we're starting to collect both our UCRs, making sure that those are competitive. And then we're trying to determine, okay, which PPO should I consider joining? I'm starting to gather some proposals from them to see what they're willing to pay me. Now, how do I make sure that if all this analysis and all this work that I'm doing is happening, that I'm actually ending up on a competitive fee schedule? Because and, and really, why does that matter? Why should I spend this time? If, if I'm planning on opening in three months or three weeks or three days, why do I need to spend this time and why does it matter? Now, this is something that to me, I feel like is always an obvious answer, but with all, all the practices we speak to, it's not always generally an obvious answer as to why this is super important and really the ramifications that it has into the future success of your practice. And so kind of some of my answers as to why does the reimbursement rate that you get paid from an insurance company ultimately matter for the, the practice is a couple of different things. Now, too often, like I've said, the practices that we speak with are leaving all of their financial success up to a couple of things, their marketing, the billing processes they've set into place, the specific staffing that they've hired, or the business strategies that they've made, or the location of their practice, which all of those things are super important, arguably all together are just as important. However, there's one thing that a lot of practices or dentists overlook, which is the reimbursement rate that you get from your insurance companies. So like I'm saying, a large part of that success that you're going to have as a dental practice is by and large going to be determined by how much profit you make from your insurance patients. In our research, typically 70 to 75% of all patients are covered by some type of PPO insurance, and that's across the United States. So if you're like most practices, 70-ish percent of all your patients are going to be paid through this third party. And that third party essentially is determining what you're going to get paid for them. So the profitability that you're going to have as a practice is determined by and large by those reimbursement rates. And that's for the most part is usually all you receive when you're getting paid for a patient. So high PPO reimbursements, they're going to mean high profitability and high revenue. When you have low reimbursements, you're going to have low profitability and low revenue. And to make matters worse, a lot of practices don't realize is that you're kind of signing your life away when you're joining an insurance company because you're getting locked in to a fee schedule for generally a minimum of two years. And so once you've agreed and credentialed and fired off an application, if you never looked at your rates or if you didn't really care and you agreed to those rates, especially if you've gone under a direct contract, you're really limiting your ability to get paid on better reimbursement because you've locked that in based on that new contract. So the next two years of your practice, a lot of that financial success has now been predetermined because of what you've agreed to. So it is a big a step. It's a big decision to make. Um, and I don't want to stress practices out, but I do want to highlight that area because I feel like that's one of those things that um, a lot of practices take for granted or don't really realize because there's so many things that you have to worry about. You know, obviously you have to figure out your, your rent, where you're going to go, your build out, your 
equipment, all those different things. So obviously there's a lot of things on your plate, but reimbursement rates are super important, something to really consider and put some time and attention towards. So let's ask ourselves, how do you actually maximize those profits and receive higher reimbursements? Well, there's some strategies that you need to understand and things that you can do to evaluate prior to sending in the applications that can really set yourself up for success and solely by doing this on your own. So again, it's not necessarily something you have to work with somebody on, but these are some important principles that if you understand them, they're going to really save you a lot of money in the long run and set you up for some good success. All right, so let's talk about the three things. Number one, we're going to talk about how to understand the power of networking. Not networking like with business context, but networking from a PPO perspective. And then talk about some common credentialing mistakes that practices do. We'll talk about how do you know the difference and understand the difference between the available PPO participation options that are there for you, and what the pros and the cons and the benefits are. And then lastly, we'll talk about some credentialing timeframes and how you should be planning accordingly with when you start your practice and things that you can do if you have the advantage of deciding when you open. So first and foremost, just wanted to reiterate that there are multiple ways that you can be in network with a PPO. You don't have to take whatever is given to you. I talk to hundreds of practices a year. Uh, we talk to thousands in general. I talk to hundreds and it's a very common uh, concern or statement made that I usually just have to take whatever the, the PPO gives me or I feel like my hands are tied. And it's definitely not the case. And it's definitely not true. Obviously, like I said, 70-ish percent of your patient base is going to be insured. However, you don't just have to take whatever is given to you. There's options for you, and there's ways that you can participate that can be more advantageous than what the standard option is going to be. So unless you decide to just blindly credential, there's things that you could do to prevent um, poor fee schedules, and there's things that you can do to ensure that you're on a better fee schedule. Um, but the, the best way to think about it is PPO participation is more of like a web than it is like one specific type of relationship. There's multiple different paths that exist and things that you can implement. So I'm going to go through the three different types of participation. This is something I cover all the time, but I found that it's the more that I reiterate it and the more uh, we break it down, the more practices realize that there are options and advantages. And if you already understand these things, at least it's going to help you take them into the context of knowing how to start your new dental practice. So there's three different ways you can really be in network with an insurance plan. There's three different participation types. The first one is what we call a direct contract. Direct contracts are the relationship that you would think you have with all insurance companies. They are probably the most common um, relationships that dentists create for themselves. What a direct contract is, is basically how you think all insurance is supposed to work. This is where you credential with an insurance company, you agree to their rates of reimbursement. And then when, after you've credentialed and you've agreed to the reimbursement rates, you treat their patient, you send in a claim, the claim gets paid on those reimbursements and everything's hunky-dory. That's how it works, right? That's a direct contract. Now, a direct contract typically means that I'm specifically working with a insurance company. So I've credentialed with Aetna. I've agreed to Aetna's fee schedule. I'm going to treat Aetna patients. Aetna's going to pay my claim. That's a direct contract, okay? The other type of participation is PPO to PPO leasing. So this is typically an arrangement that most practices don't specifically choose to join. This is usually something that happens to you, but it is something that you can strategically set yourself under if you're doing it correctly. PPO to PPO leasing is something that's become more common and is increasingly becoming more common for practices across the country. This is where it starts with a direct contract. So let's pretend like the orange insurance company is Aetna and the green insurance company is Guardian. So you start by directly credentialing with Aetna. You agree to Aetna's reimbursement rates, treating Aetna patients, because they have the power to do so, Aetna and basically every other insurance company is allowed to lease you out or borrow you out to any other insurance company. What that means is Guardian can come along and if they don't currently have a relationship with you, they can borrow you from Aetna. They pay Aetna a fee to do that. And usually those are pretty high fees, but they can literally borrow the contract that you've created. And with a couple of signatures, they can establish that leasing arrangement. Then what happens is maybe you get like a letter in the mail or an email that says, congratulations, you're now in network with Guardian through Aetna. Maybe you've noticed that, maybe you don't. But what it means is Guardian patients are now going to start showing up at your practice. You're going to send a claim into Guardian, expecting for it to be paid out of network or some other way. And now all of a sudden it's paid in network and under Aetna's reimbursement rates. So that's a PPO to PPO leasing arrangement. By its nature, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a different arrangement and it's how they are accessing you that matters. Okay, so those type of arrangements exist all over the place. 
Aetna leases out to six or seven other carriers. Guardian leases out to a bunch of carriers. Almost every insurance company has active leasing relationships back and forth, either one way or two ways. So there's a lots of different ways you can potentially participate. And knowing that that exists allows and opens up opportunities for you when you're thinking about joining an insurance. Well, maybe I do want to credential with Guardian directly, or maybe I don't. Maybe I want to go with Guardian through Aetna if Aetna has a better fee schedule. Or maybe I want to go with Guardian through Sun Life if Sun Life has a better fee schedule. So just knowing that those options exist are crucial and super important. I think a lot of it, we take this for granted because this is what we do every day. Um, but we understand that not every practice understands the current existing relationships or even how to access those. So that's what I'm really here today is to educate you on is to explain that there's other ways you can participate with insurance, still be in network, still appear on their website, still send claims in normally. All that's different is the reimbursement rate that's paid and how the claim is processed. Otherwise, you're still in network. You're just getting paid on a different reimbursement. And if that reimbursement is better, that's an optimization opportunity that you could have avoided or had a worse opportunity if you just credential directly with somebody. So if this PPO has a direct contract and their fee schedule is 50% of your UCR, or you can go and network with that same insurance through somebody else and it's 80% of your UCR, that's a 30% difference, okay? Just by simply understanding who you should credential with first, all right? So that's what we're talking about. It's being strategic of how you're going to join an insurance can ultimately determine the reimbursement rates you make. The last type of participation is what we call umbrella networking. This is a really common misconception about how umbrella networks work, um, but we found that more and more practices are joining umbrella networks, which is, there's not, again, not necessarily a bad thing, but they're joining them without understanding really what the ramifications are or how they operate. So an umbrella network company, a true umbrella network is also goes by the name of a third party administrator. So companies like Carrington, Connection Dental, GEHA, Zealous, Maverist, Denimax, companies like that typically aren't considered a typical insurance company. They're more of a considered an umbrella network. How they operate is they are an aggregate or an aggregator of multiple insurance companies at once. Hence the name an umbrella. So there's lots of PPOs falling underneath them. So for example, if you go and credential today with a company like Connection or Denimax or Carrington, they typically don't have card carrying patients. What they've done is they've created a lot of relationships with many other insurance companies. And Denimax or Carrington, they have their own fee schedule. So if you agree to their fee schedule and you're happy with it, you credential with them. Then they turn around and they shoot your information out to all the people in their umbrella network. And depending on how those PPOs individually receive it, they may access you now and set you up underneath that umbrella. So if these three PPOs establish a relationship with you under the umbrella, that, let's pretend like that's Aetna, Guardian, MetLife. Now for all those patients, you're getting paid through Denimax's fee schedule, which again, there's no bad or good. It all comes down to reimbursement and what your preferences are. But it's important to understand that that's how the claim is going to get paid. You still send a claim into Aetna, the claim is still paid by Aetna, but it's paid according to uh, Zealous or Denimax's or Carrington's reimbursement rates. So hopefully that makes sense to you. So knowing that these different arrangements exist should help open your eyes to all the possibilities and different ways that you can participate. And that's the rule of thumb is if there's five or six ways I can participate with an insurance company through different companies, generally every company has their own fee schedule with their own budgets and their own relative reimbursement rates. So how does Aetna compare to Guardian, compare to Connection, compare to Carrington, compare to Sun Life? Their fee schedules are gonna be vastly different. Some of them may have better restorative reimbursements. Some of them may have better preventative reimbursements, but then there's also advantages and disadvantages to directly contracting or going through an umbrella. In a lot of scenarios, directly contracting may happen faster or quicker than going through an umbrella because you're going specifically with that insurance. Um, and sometimes going through an umbrella may take extra time because they take a little bit longer to credential and then they have to send your information off to that, that third party. So again, there's some pros and cons there, but again, it's important to realize that the reimbursement rates are different. And if they're vastly different and you can strategically align to whatever one's the highest, then you can get yourself on a better fee schedule. Hopefully that makes sense. So again, just wanna kind of hit this concept home. You have participation options. So if you were evaluating a specific insurance and trying to decide, do I wanna go through an umbrella network with this insurance? or do I wanna go through a direct contract, you have to understand that you can't do both. In many cases, a direct contract, once you've sent a contract in and you've credentialed with an insurance company, it doesn't matter if you're already with that umbrella, that direct contract is gonna trump the umbrella. So if you send in an application into Denimax, 
because you wanted an Aetna to fall under Denimax, but you also send in an application to Aetna, it doesn't matter if you ever fall in with Denimax, Aetna is likely going to trump that because you've sent in a direct contract. So that's another thing to keep in mind is you can't just find the option you want and then call them up and say, hey, make sure you pay me here. You have to make sure that you're not trumping or superseding arrangements by sending in a direct contract when you want, wanted to fall in network under an umbrella. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So again, knowing that there's certain arrangements that can trump, you have to be specific and strategic and make sure that you're not sending in an application in this scenario if you wanted it to fall underneath this scenario. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Okay. Now let's talk about understanding some of the credentialing timeframes that we've experienced and really what that means for you. Again, if you've got questions, feel free to put them in through the q and I don't see a ton. So if you, hopefully this is new information or hopefully this is helpful for you guys, but feel free to put those in through the Q&A um, and we'll get to those towards the end. But let's talk about and chat about the credentialing timeframes and things that you can kind of expect. So obviously many PPOs and umbrella networks do their own credentialing. The process for credentialing takes a little bit of time. Most of those are paper applications. And so you're filling that out or some your third party like us is filling that out, sending it into the insurance company. That in itself takes a little bit of time, a couple of weeks to gather information, make sure that you got the right report, send it off to the insurance company. And then the insurance company receives it. They document the information. And then when you're getting credentialed or contacted for the first time, a lot of insurance companies are vetting your information, to make sure that it's legitimate. They're, they're calling your, your university to make sure that you're actually uh you actually graduated with a, a, a dental degree. You're, they're verifying your dental license. They're, they're looking you up through malpractice to, to see if you've had any malpractice claims. They're doing a lot of digging and due diligence to see if you're a legitimate dentist, that there's no malpractice claims against you. And they're vetting whether or not they want to allow you in their network. So it takes some time to, to process that information and to accept you. So most PPOs in our umbrella networks take anywhere from 30 to 90 days after you sent in the application to get you credentialed, meaning before they turn around and tell you, all right, you're now in network, here's your effective date. So as of January 1st, you can treat patients and we'll pay those claims. So it takes time, anywhere from 30 to 90 days after you've submitted the application. So again, keep that in mind when you're starting your practice. If you're wanting to open your doors and be totally perfectly in network, it's gonna take time, 30 to 90 days, probably the best case scenario, plus add another week or two for the time it's gonna to take to go call the insurance company and figure out if you want to work with that specific reimbursement rate or if you're going to do something else, also to evaluate, is this the application I need? Get it filled out to gather your information. So you're going to want to account for that. And again, if you're wanting to open up your doors, for example, if you're on the call today and you're not credentialed yet and you want to open your doors in 30 or 60 days, you're likely going to be out of network. Um, so you want to keep that in mind. Maybe you want to set your startup date further out or at least just know that going into it that you're going to stay out of network for a little bit of time because of the processing time from insurance companies, okay? Now, again, like I said earlier, you wanna consider these timeframes when you're selecting whether or not to participate through a direct contract or a leasing arrangement or an umbrella relationship. It's been our experience that typically, if you wanna go participate with somebody like Guardian through an umbrella company, that's gonna take a little bit longer than it's gonna to take to just directly credential with Guardian. So a lot of what we present when we do this for clients is we say, a lot of times when you're starting a practice, you kind of have two choices with each insurance. You have speed or you have reimbursement. So you can get a network quickly, but that usually means that you get on the lower fee schedule, but you're in your network sooner, right? So you can start treating patients. Or if you want to go for the reimbursement route, it's going to take some time to make some evaluations to determine what's the best fit for you, what's the best out of the six available ways to participate. That's going to take some time to evaluate and gather that information. And then if that means ultimately oh, I want to go in network, but I but I think we should go in network under an umbrella. Well, you're going to credential with that umbrella. Sometimes they're a little bit slower at getting credentialed because of the type of company that they are or their processes, but then they also have to send that information to all the people underneath their umbrella. So those take a little bit longer. So again, it's not always apples and apples where you're just picking the best reimbursement and jumping on it. There's pros and cons to either of those scenarios. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to that and you're communicating with those insurance companies prior to sending those applications to know kind of what their turnaround time is. Also, you want to be sure you're paying attention to, like I said, what you're signing up for. The fee schedules that you're accepting or you're credentialing with, especially if it's a direct contract, you're, you're typically going to be locked into those for a minimum of two years. So you want to make sure that that's a good offer. You want to make sure you're comfortable with those reimbursement rates because what you agree to, you're locked in. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't go terminate the contract. You can't 
PBOs aren't going to lock you in and not allow you to ever leave them, right? You can always go out of network, but that's not usually the strategy that you want to employ in the first couple of years of being a new practice. So it's just important to realize that the, the importance of those reimbursement rates is there because the first two or more years of your practice, your success is determined by and large by those reimbursement rates. So pay attention to that. Make sure that you're taking that evaluation seriously. So again, when you're deciding between speed and reimbursement, it may be tempting to get networks faster because I'm trying to open in three weeks, but you also need to realize that if I get a network faster, but I also take kind of a crappy fee schedule, I'm going to be locked into that for a long time. So I got to weigh those pros and those cons. Okay. And again, it's not an easy decision, but when we work with our clients, we help them evaluate those. We give you really accurate timelines and turnaround times on what those specific PPOs are taking and help you calculate the benefit between a standard fee schedule and a and a better fee schedule. So there's some things that we can help you out with. But again, if you're doing this on your own, you want to take that into account prior to making those decisions. Now, lastly, obviously, you don't want to gather um, every possible PPO application that exists and then just send them all in. That is the most common credentialing mistake that I've experienced or heard of is I've, just, I've done all this work and all this research to know which chairs I'm going to have, the location I have. I'm going to figure out the, the best associates to hire. I'm going to do all this digging and marketing companies and I'm going to do all this work. And then almost as like an afterthought, it's, oh, dang it, I got to get credentials with insurances. And so what every practice ends up doing is they have an office manager that they've hired or they do it themselves. They just go call a bunch of insurance companies, get the 14, 15, 20 applications, fill them out real fast and just send them in. The worst possible thing that you can do. It's like, a, it's kind of a silly analogy, but that's like the equivalent of taking like five water balloons and trying to wash your car just by chucking them at your car and hoping that it washes your car. It's going to be pretty ineffective. And if anything, it's going to cause more problems. So the problem with that is if you just fire out a bunch of applications. You're one, you don't know what you're signing up for. Two, you're going to get locked into some uh, low fee schedules. And three, you're going to trump a lot of potential optimization opportunities because you just send in a bunch of direct contracts. So if it would have made more sense to credential with Guardian under somebody else, but you just send in an application to Guardian, well, now you're under a direct contract. So it doesn't matter if you're if you send in an, 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 an application in Venomax or Carrington because you want Guardian to go underneath them. You, if you're under a direct contract, that's going to trump it. So the only way you're going to get, be able to get out of that is you're going to have to terminate and go out of network. So again, you got to keep that in mind when you're making these decisions. Firing off a bunch of applications is the worst thing to do. Um, and then lastly, time and patience are your greatest assets if you use them correctly and use them if you can. Obviously, there's always different scenarios. If you're buying an existing practice, I realize sometimes you don't have the luxury of time. So there's different strategies you can implement and we'd be happy to talk to you about kind of different things you can try. But for the most part, if you're starting a brand new practice, Time is your greatest asset because you can get, you can virtually determine when you're going to open your doors and that patience and deciding between speed and reimbursement can really make all the difference. So again, this is, these are the things that we've learned and experienced and hopefully these have been helpful for you. I just want to kind of rehash the key takeaways of what we've gone through today. I know some of you jumped on about 10 minutes in, so you may have missed the first couple of steps, but I know that there is going to be a recording, so you should get that afterwards, probably in the next day or two. But just the key takeaways of what we're talking about is number one, make sure that you're setting competitive UCRs. There's a huge correlation between high UCRs and having good PPO reimbursements. If you set your UCRs arbitrarily or you just randomly decide what you think you should price them at, you're probably going to miss the mark. So use available percentile tools that are out there to set yourself in good percentiles. 60 to 80 percentiles is generally a good area to shoot for. Lastly, next thing is you want to evaluate the common PPOs in your area. So perform those steps of that local market analysis. Do your research, figure out who the top employers are, give them a call, ask them who they're offering their benefits through. A lot of employers will answer those questions, document that, then reach out and understand that there's just because that's a PPO that's popular doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go directly contract with them. Go look at all the different options that are out there of how you can participate, evaluate those fee schedules, look at them in comparison to your UCR figure out who's got a good UCR percentage uh, reimbursement and evaluate those together. And obviously be patient, take your time when you're evaluating those decisions. These rates are going to be locked in and they're going to determine a lot of your financial success for the next couple of years. And then lastly, kind of our core business at Unitas is to help negotiate and optimize reimbursement rates. Many of the practices we work with are already in business. They've been in business for two, five, 10, 15 years. 
our core business exists, honestly, because thousands and thousands of dentists don't pay attention to what they're signing up for when they start. And then they end up having to hire us to fix that two or five or 10 years later because they didn't pay attention to what they're signing up for or because they didn't know. They didn't know that they had an option. So that's what I'm trying to do today is, is to help you to kind of save you from that, that lack of knowledge that a lot of practices have, that they don't, they don't know that they have options. They don't know that there's ways that you can be more strategic on deciding how to join an insurance. And that's really why we exist. That's why we have so much business is because we're trying to help mitigate and fix what was started by just signing up with standard low fee schedules. That's why we come in and we help negotiate and optimize it and fix the participation afterwards. Okay. So again, if you're looking to start a new dental practice, if you're looking to acquire an existing practice, obviously a lot of the things that I went through today, we can help you out with. A lot of these things you can do on your own, but obviously you're super busy. And I'm sure there's a lot of things you're worrying about as you're starting a new, new dental practice. So we'd be happy to help you out with these. We have a lot of different service products that kind of fit different areas. So I'd be happy to chat with you on the phone. If you go to unitishsd.com, you can schedule a free complimentary consultation with our team. Generally, if you, if you mark in that you're interested in starting a practice, we'll funnel you to the people on our team who actively work with practices that are starting. And they can just help assess your, you know, when you're planning on opening, if you're transitioning ownership, or if you're buying from scratch, if you're building and kind of work in, uh, help you understand what the different options are. But, but in total, there's a lot of things we can help you out with, most of which we've kind of gone through today. We can, we can help do that analysis to evaluate your UCRs. We can help perform that local market analysis. We can go gather that information from the employers, do all that digging, figure out what the popular PPOs are in your area. We can use our leverage of the tons of clients we have and all the information we have of, of current fee schedules to then negotiate with your PPOs prior to you credentialing. So instead of just reaching out and saying, hey, what fee schedule can you offer to us? We're negotiating that offer. We can do that. Uh, we can also help obviously do participation optimization. We know that there's six or seven ways that you can participate with Aetna or Guardian or Sun Life. We'll look into each of those, figure out which one ultimately is gonna yield the most revenue for you, help you weigh the pros and the cons of speed versus reimbursement and make those recommendations for you. And then ultimately we can help you with the full credentialing process. We can do a start to finish, credentialing process. Well, we know which applications to fill out. We can send them in, make sure that they're followed up with, that you follow in network. We submit hundreds and hundreds of applications a month. So we can help you out with that as well. We also do some EOB auditing to make sure that you're getting paid correctly. Once you credential, we do website audits to make sure that you're actually showing up on those directories. There's a ton of stuff that we can help you out with and different tiers and options for you, depending on kind of what your situation is. So again, if, you, if you're interested in us, we're just talking to us about kind of the strategy. Those consultations are complimentary. A lot of the consultations we take, practices never work with us and that's okay. We're here to help and, and help you understand kind of what your options are. And again, like today, hopefully this was helpful information to you and the, and the representatives that you're gonna to talk to when you schedule, like I said, are working with practices just like you. They can give you a ton of free, super helpful information. Um, but just a rem reminder, we help practices of all types. If you're building a new practice, if you're buying an existing location, if you're already established and you're already in network, and like I was describing earlier, if you're already in network, you've been in network for a couple of years and you're just unhappy with your reimbursement rates, it's likely because of this. We can help kind of mitigate that and solve that problem for you. We can negotiate. We can still optimize years after. There's still opportunities to fix it, what's been set up. And so if you're interested in speaking with us, just go to that website, schedule a complimentary call. They're usually 30 minutes at most. We do a little screen share with you if we need to. Otherwise, it's just a simple phone call. No pressure. We talk about kind of what your options are, um, what your situation is, and, and what kind of services we have to offer. So hopefully that's helpful to you guys. At this point, um, kind of wanted to jump into some Q&A or any chats that have come through. Uh, so Corinne, if you've got some Q&As for me, I'd be happy to answer those now. Um, and yeah. just kind of answer any questions you guys have. Perfect. Thank you, Philip. And just a reminder, you can um, put your questions in the Q&A section of the control panel. Um, so if you want to submit them, you can, but I will read off what we have so far. Awesome. So the first question, can I start this process before I even get my license? I should be licensed in about three to four months and plan to start growing my own practice right away. Um, absolutely. There's a lot of insurance companies that uh, will provides you or provide us with like an offer of what they're willing to pay you um, solely with just like a social security number. So you don't have to have a necessarily a tax ID number yet. 
or even a license, you can usually approach them. Mm -hmm. Obviously, once you credential, you're going to need an actual tax ID, an actual license to get credentials with them. But a lot of this process can be started ahead of time. So obviously, whoever asked that question, I'm sure you're in your last couple months before graduating. So yes, that process can get started earlier than you might think. And then a lot of PPOs will consider providing you with those offers, even if you, all you have is a social security number. So reach out to us and we'd be happy to kind of talk you through the, the options there. Great. All right. The next question, is there an umbrella that Delta can fall under? That's a super common question. So Lucy, unfortunately, the answer is typically no. Um, Delta Dental is historically one of the main insurance companies that doesn't do any leasing or umbrella networking. Um, because they are separate state entities, that's just not an arrangement that they've, uh, to our knowledge, have gone into in many states. So to participate with Delta is to participate directly or to not participate at all. So unfortunately, there's not other options for you besides either being a network under their PPO and Premier plan or not being a network at all. So hopefully that answers your question. All right. Awesome. And then Brian has a question in here. Is the fee for service only practice still even an option today? He references um, the Kodak study. That is a good question. So be, doing this for about 10 years, we've kind of seen a change in the industry. So uh, my answer to that is kind of anecdotal, but I do feel like if anybody has a good pulse on what's, what's the most common practice setup, probably us. And, and obviously Henry Shine, because we talked to thousands of practices a year. Um, so is the fee-for-service only practice still an option today? I'd say, of course, it's still an option. Is it becoming less and less popular or doable? I'd say probably yes. In our experience, um, out of the practices we talk to, it's a very relatively small percentage that are currently fee-for-service and are doing so successfully without feeling the pressure to join PPOs. So many of the practices that we talk to that are fee-for-service are talking to us because they're feeling like they can't continue to sustain that model. It's not that it's impossible by any means. There's lots of successful practices that do that. Um, but in relativity to the overall amount of practices in the country, uh, it's our experience that it's a very small percentage that are one, mostly out of network, and two, are doing so successfully. Most practices that are mainly fee for service are typically taking kind of the two or three, the big three is kind of what we consider. So like your, your Delta, your MetLife, in your Anthem Blue Cross for that state, and then mainly out of network with everybody else. It's very, very uncommon for us, at least, to, to interact with a practice that's just purely out of network. When we do, in my experience, it's usually a specialist, so like an endodontics or an oral surgeon, just because of the nature of how that practice runs, um, it lends itself to be a little easier to just be on a network because your patients aren't usually recurring, right? And they're expecting, a, you know, a large service fee anyways that they're going to likely go through care credit on. Um, but to answer your question, Brian, it's very uncommon. Um, and just like the data that we've shown, 70 to 75 percent of all Americans have some form of insurance. And so, again, if you're going to be purely fee for service, um, you're, it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to be able to sustain a whole practice on cash paying patients. So obviously you're going to have to treat patients that are insured. doesn't mean that they won't come to you if you're at a network. I know lots of practices that treat patients out of network and the patients don't care. But again, what you're working against is all the other dentists that are in network and you're working against the constant education that insured patients receive. Whenever they go see an out of network doctor, there's a lot of insurances that will send an email or series of letters to that patient saying, hey, we noticed you went to an out of network doctor. I'm not sure if you know this, but that's gonna cost you more out of pocket. Here's a list of in network doctors in your area. There's a lot of insurance companies that do that. So it's important to keep that in mind. While that is kind of frustrating, a lot of PBOs are actively educating their patients on how and where there are in-network doctors, which obviously that it gets frustrating if you're the out-of-network doctor, but that's, that's part of the value proposition of, of the PBOs. Hey, you're not really accessing our benefits by going to somebody out-of-network. You should probably go to these guys. So again, if you're trying to sustain the out-of-network model, I would say it's probably going to be pretty difficult. Again, it's not impossible. If it's something you're interested in, I would suggest doing research and reaching out to practices that you know of that are doing so successfully and figure out what they're doing. Because you're going to need to lean more heavily on some marketing, some patient retention strategies, treatment plan acceptance strategies, um, more so than a typical in-network practice would have to do so. So hopefully that answers your question. All right. The next question we have is, if I direct contract with Aetna because the reimbursement is better, will one be unable to apply for an umbrella if it includes Aetna? 
So you're not unable to, to credential with an umbrella network. So to understand your question clearly, let's say you've credentialed directly with Aetna, right? You agreed to the rates. And then you find out that Aetna as a network also has a partnership with Connection Dental. And you find out that Connection Dental's fee schedule is higher. And so you want to go credential with Connection because you want your Aetna patients paying under them. So if you go join Connection Dental, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, Connection has a relationship with a bunch of other insurances. So by doing that, you're going to now be in network with potentially all the other insurances that they network with or partner with, unless you strategically opt out of those, which you likely won't. Okay. But just because you're now in network connection, to answer your question, no, that's not going to trump your Aetna direct contract. If you're direct with Aetna, in most states, in most situations, that direct contract is going to trump and you're going to continue to stay under that direct contract. And it's not going to change. Now, what you're suggesting, though, is what we consider optimization, and it's something that we, we do for practices, but it is very risky, and it comes with um, tons of risk and pros and cons. If you want to specifically switch from a direct contract to moving under an umbrella network, there's ways you can do that, but it generally means some type of out-of-network time. So you may have to sever or terminate your relationship with Aetna or that insurance company, make sure you're credentialed here, communicate with both parties in the hopes that Connection sends information to Aetna and then Aetna elects to pick you back up in network now underneath Connection Dental. It's possible. We do it a lot for practices with many insurance companies. But again, going from a direct, you have to typically go out of network to then go under an umbrella. And then going out of network can take time. That could be 30 days, 60 days, six months. Depends on the insurance company. Depends on what they're doing at that time. And, but again, that's out of network time. That's risky for you. So again, if you're in a scenario where you're a new practice and you can start and choose before sending in an application, you want to choose potentially the better option prior to sending in a direct contract. So hopefully that answers your question. But again, those type of recommendations, like I said, are super risky. I do recommend talking to somebody in our team just to get um, kind of the most accurate information of how long that's taking, if that's something you're thinking about doing and what the pros and the cons are prior to trying to do that or working with somebody like us to do it. All right, great. Um, the last question we have is, do we need to do the credentialing for part-time dentists? That's a super common question too. So um, it can be a little frustrating or counterintuitive when you bring on a part-time dentist or worse, you need a temp dentist to come in and you just need them when you need them, right? So if the doctor's out sick, you just, maybe you've got a temp or somebody that you usually kind of, kind of fill in for you. It's very tempting to be like, why would I go through the credentialing process if this guy or girl or this lady is not gonna be here all the time, right? They're just here temporarily. And so what a lot of practices uh, will do is they'll just potentially not credential them. And so the way they get around that is they'll send in a claim saying underneath the owner doctor's name saying that he was the treating or she was the treating provider, even though the temporary or the part-time dentist did the work. Now, let, let's be clear. That is typically illegal. That's typically um, against insurance contracts. That's against ADA regulations. That's against insurance regulations. You need to put down on the claim who rendered the actual treatment. So again, if that's been somebody's strategy, make sure that that's not the strategy you're implementing. However, uh, Ying, to answer your question, you should credential that doctor if you want to number one, if you're going to bill properly and say that that doctor rendered the treatment, if you do that and he or she is not credentialed, when the claim's paid, it's going to get paid out of network. And so if you're okay with that um, and you're okay with the patient paying more out of pocket or the patient having to eat at their annual maximum more quickly, then that's fine. But in most scenarios, when you are an established practice and you've got an owner, an associate that's treating patients and those patients are in network and they're used to their claims being paid, either a portion or the full amount, specifically like on cleanings, if they go and they get treated by a temporary dentist or a part-time dentist and that claim is paid out of network, they're going to have to pay more. Most patients, if they notice that, will be pretty unhappy. So the best rule of thumb is if you have any dentist, whether full-time or part-time, that you uh, are planning on having treat your patients, the best possible thing you can do is to get them credentialed. Even if they're only going to work there one day a month, uh, it's worth the effort to send in an application. So that way, when they treat the patients, the patient doesn't have to pay necessarily any more than what they would have been paying if they were treated by the normal dentist. That's usually there. So hopefully that answers your question. Awesome. That was great. Well, thank you so much, Phil, for answering all of the questions and for the great presentation tonight. And thank you to United Dental for sponsoring this webinar. 
If anyone has any questions, you can email us at webinars at henryshine.com. And as a thank you for attending, everyone will receive the recording via email in the next week. And we appreciate you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Awesome. Thanks, Corinne. Thanks, everyone.